So let me start off with this, right? So if y'all got go to my pin tweet, um, let me go ahead and I'm just gonna start sharing these one by one. Uh, and again, after I go through some of these, and there's gonna be a little bit of reading, guys. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I know they say flirt don't read, but hey. When we do, we end up finding stuff out, and it's super freaking interesting. And I really want y'all to get this sauce. And after we run through this, I'm going to let uh, Alan take over. And if anybody else want to chime in on the topic, feel free. Um, so we're talking about stellar parallax. Now, what is stellar parallax? This is an observation of the stars, right? So we're talking about uh, background stars, stars that are in a foreground and in our position. And the stars in the foreground seem to displace and they claim that this is due to the motion of earth. So when we're talking about parallax, they always give this example, hey, just hold a finger in front of your face and close one eye, blink it and close the other eye and blink it and you can see your finger move, but it's just an apparent position that's moving. It's not really moving. So that's parallax. So they're saying, hey, this is what's happening in the sky, that there's a displacement of stars in the foreground relative to the background okay so there's a displacement of stars in the foreground relative mm -hmm. to the background now this is this can be challenged that's you know one thing that people say is that there is no parallax but let's just you know operate in a paradigm that they have detected some parallax over some amount of years right it doesn't happen like instantaneously even though we are shooting around the sun 66,000 miles per hour and the sun's shooting through a solar system at a half million miles per hour and the whole solar system is shooting through the galaxy at over a million miles per hour but you know it gets <laughs> it gets a little tough to find this displacement but what's interesting about this is that you can find this equivalence from a geocentric position now what do i mean by that so if you look at this i posted a diagram up top right this is the tweet that's labeled stellar parallax heliocentrism versus geocentrism right what is heliocentrism the earth's motion around the sun versus geocentrism which is the earth being the center stationary of all things which is observably correct but let's leave my bias out of it let's just talk about the facts so this tweet reads swapping coordinate systems or frame of references from a stationary sun which is what we observe, right, uh, on a globe model with a moving Earth to a stationary Earth and a moving sun results in an observable equivalence of stellar parallax. Now, if you look at the diagram, um, I guess it's from 1832. Um, this I got this from Robert Bennett. Shout out to PhD Robert Bennett. Um, they got a couple of dope lives over uh, with Alan and Witsit on their channels y'all go check it out um maybe alan may tweet some of it out if you want to go save it to your uh your video list at the top i just want to break this down very simply it has a sun as the stationary position right and it has like this kind of like oblate ellipse and this is like the motion of the earth that's supposed to be following this path and it starts out at january and then it ends in July. So you need pretty much like a six month period in order to observe like this type of parallax with a earth that's in motion, right? This is what's given to us from the heliocentric model, motion around the sun. Now, what they don't tell you is that if you just swap the coordinate systems and have earth as the stationary uh, position, which is what we observe, right? We all observe the earth as stationary and these luminaries in the sky moving around us. And you have the sun starting out in January, going to July. You can have like a, an equivalence in the observations. And what I mean by that is that it's not exclusive to the first diagram. It's literally almost like an inversion of triangles, right? They say, hey, I know we observe everything. It's like it's a stationary earth and the luminary is moving above our eye, uh, 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 in the sky above us. But actually, we're not stationary. We're actually in motion. And what Robert Bennett highlighted is that they don't put this other option in the textbooks. It's like completely left out. Like they don't even want you to know about it. And like, you know, you can diagram this. There's a mathematical equivalence to this. And I found that to be super interesting 
the fact that these glow birthers don't talk about this. They don't talk about the equivalence that you can have with parallax, which means if you have a stationary earth with the stars moving, that is not exclusive to a heliocentric model, right? So that's the first part to this, that stellar parallax does not mean the earth is moving. So I want you to save this tweet, y'all. Save it. I don't care. Send it to yourself. Save it. The next time some globe earther says, hey, the reason why we're moving exclusively is because of parallax. Send them this diagram. Be like, we already covered that in episode 84. Stop trying to gaslight me or learn something, Mr. Globe Earther, because we get into it at Flat Earth Fridays. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's what I want you guys to say, because that's a very important piece to this puzzle. Now, I also linked a couple of clips. Um, shout out to Wissy and Alan. Um, they had a discussion with Robert Bennett, like I said earlier, and they break down this diagram. It's a dope clip that Alan got on his uh, YouTube. Y'all can go look at that and save that for later. Um, I also included another clip from Alan. Um, where he goes in depth, a little bit more in depth, which we'll probably get to in a few minutes with Stellar Parallax and some of the things that he discovered. Um, but I also, like I said, I want to be honest with you guys. I got to make sure that you get both sides of the argument. You know, we talk about this all the time. You can't just feed somebody one, one side of it and not give them the other side. So we said, okay, what are the globe birthers saying about Parallax, right? Now, the second part of the conversation in the TikTok wasn't only just heliocentrism versus geocentrism, right? Whether this is exclusive motion around the sun. The other interesting thing about parallax, which I found out, shout out to you, Alan, that the stars move in the wrong direction, bro. <laughs> so just think about this. So, you know, I was talking to Proud about this, trying to like figure out a way to like, you know, uh, present this to you guys so just like i said earlier where like if you have your finger in front of your face and you're blinking back and forth back and forth you see your your finger displacing apparently right imagine after doing it two and three times and you're, you you kind of predict which way your finger is moving the next time you did it your finger didn't move where you thought it was going to move it moved in the opposite direction right like if you're displacing to one side you think that something in front of you is going to move to the other side but it does it doesn't move that way it moves in the wrong direction, bro. This is what's called negative parallax. Now, I had no idea what like a negative parallax was a thing, which is what I found out that most people don't because like I just told you guys, I just talked to a few physicists yesterday and they had no idea what I was talking about. But well, we already covered this like briefly, but I thought that it was super important to talk about since like clearly... This is not common knowledge. So I said, let's go look at like what the globe earthers are saying about this, because there's, there's no way if we could predict or if we're talking about models and predictions. And then you say, hey, the stars are supposed to move this way because this is the way we're orbiting. But then when we look at the stars, they're actually moving that way. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. How are you globe earthers going to explain this? Like there's just... You can't be dishonest, right? You got to acknowledge the actual observation. So not only can we observe this from a geocentric, geostationary position, the stars are moving the wrong way. Bro, Globe Earthers, tell me what's going on. So I went to the Globe Earth Zealot website. Shout out to Flat Earth BS. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They be filling all the propaganda all over the place. And I said, let me sit through this and let me see exactly how they're going to explain a displacement of stars that move in the wrong direction. Guess what they say, y'all? Let me read this to you. So this is what the tweet says, and I'll, let me share it up top because I don't know if I share this yet. So this is what Flatter BS says. So this is what my tweet reads. Hi, uh, Flatter BS highlights SciComm's best explanation for observing this apparent motion of stars which is displacing in the wrong direction, assuming a globe that's in motion. They describe this by statistical uncertainty and measurement error. <laughs> Wait, what? Let me read this to y'all. Negative parallax, 
according to the official globe earth explanation stellar parallax is the apparent shift of closer stars right stars in the foreground against distant stars stars in the background due to the orbit of earth so they're already affirming a consequence right being fallacious right off the bat they can't even get through one sentence <laughs> without assuming the ending right negative parallax and they say they're honest about this stars going the wrong way occurs due to measurement errors placing the nearer star as the far one and vice versa so this is what they're saying y'all they're saying hey we are grouping certain stars by what we observe maybe their luminosity the way that they oscillate you know these group of stars do this so they got to be further away and these group of stars do this so they got to be closer to us so this is what they do they kind of like guesstimate this and you already heard brian talk to you earlier about how they have these distances at astronomical like lengths you know one light year is 5.8 trillion miles y'all y'all gotta like wrap your head around that there is no star that's one light year away so we're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of miles away, okay? So it continues. Stellar parallax is the motion of the stars relative to the other stars. We do not know beforehand which stars are closer than the others. According to Globe Earth and SciComm, they don't know. <laughs> These have to be inferred using, using statistical analysis from data. Parallax of distant stars should be practically zero. So you say, hey, we actually shouldn't really see any displacement of stars because we told y'all that they trillions of miles away. <laughs> they said, but we kind of we kind of see some parallax. <laughs> the problem is we're telling you that we are spinning wobbling in that direction which should cause the stars to go in this direction however the stars are going in that direction and this is a problem this is because of statistical uncertainty do you want to know how many of the stars have this incorrect displacement y'all and we're going to get into some real numbers in a second. Half of them. <laughs> so don't get it confused. We are not talking about one or two, a few dozen, a couple hundred. No. Half of them, bro. This is not flat. This is not like sacred making shit up. This is not like a flat earth thing. This is officially from the globe earthers. Half of the stars based on our apparent or, or suspected motion are all going in the wrong direction. Half of them, bro. And it's all due to statistical uncertainties and measurement errors. It's always a correction or an instrument error. Anytime that a prediction on the globe model fails, this is how they explain it. Oh, our instruments were designed to do this but we don't really get our prediction. So it got to be the instrument that's fucked up. Like it ain't that, it ain't that we're wrong. <laughs> I know we experience everything that it's stationary, but that's not the case. I know it may just be the stars that are moving in the sky, but that can't be it because then we got to throw out heliocentrism and gravity. Like we can't do that because we have to start physics all over. And then we have to actually admit that we were wrong and lie to y'all the whole time. So it's just got to be the instruments. It got to be. What? So I don't just want to hit y'all with just memes, right? So we got to actually like get to some of the actual paperwork itself. And I'm going to let Alan take over after this. So let me share this paper up top. Because, you know, we do talk about scientific papers in Flat Earth Fridays. We don't just be pulling shit out of our ass. No, we get straight to it for real. So this comes from OJ Lee. Right? This is on a reason for the appearance of negative parallaxes in the determination of distances of stars. And, you know, they kind of detail 
some of the reasoning for why these stars may be displacing in the incorrect direction. So I'm just going to read a little bit of this. And I, like I said, I, we're going to move on and go on let Alan kind of like deep dive into this a little bit more. So this paper states, essentially, there is no mystery about negative parallaxes. At least for, uh, at least for the first order quantities, they must occur for one or more of the three following reasons. So they give three reasons on why, you know, the stars are moving in the wrong direction. Like I said, mostly because it's instrument error or, you know, they predict that, okay, this star was supposed to be far away, but it's really closer. So we just got that wrong. Sorry, guys, we got half of them incorrect. But my thing is, what about the fourth possibility? Why are you leaving out the possibility that maybe we're just the ones that are stationary and then some of the stars just wander or they move on their own? Like, why aren't we postulating that as an option? What, why are we just dismissing that? Is that honest? Is that how science works to, to cherry pick or to include a bias when you're making these scientific observations because i thought you're supposed to remove your bias i thought like hey if it just if it doesn't work you throw it out i didn't know you're supposed to ignore the other options that are completely viable <laughs> right so i said no nah, this can't be this can't be let's get into some details let's actually let's actually look at the numbers right and see what exactly is happening so i did a little bit of deep dive alan has sent me some stuff and I started looking through it and I found like this reference and I thought that this was crazy, bro. I want y'all to really listen to it. And I'm going to damn near read every single word on this. I don't care what y'all think. I'm sorry. We're going to have to get to it because this blew my mind. Now, this is I just shared a tweet up top. This is from a paper uh, from Dr. Neville Tom Thomas Jones, Ph.D. And it's titled Heliocentric Problem Number Four negative parallax bro this is not like no flat earthers this is some guys that are saying hey you know i kind of believe in a globe earth but i'm just letting y'all know it's kind of equally viable that geocentrism might be a thing as a matter of fact it kind of works a little bit better and i'm going to be honest about that and i'm going to publish this now what's crazy about it that this was taken off the internet and it took a little bit more digging to find this because when I clicked the link, I couldn't find it. So I had to like do a whole bunch of jumping through the hoops just to find what this paper has said. And I linked it for you guys. So y'all got it. Now pay attention to what, to what this says. Now, apparently they sent this satellite, right? And we can get into this a little bit later. Actually, I want to do a space on this because Alan and Toby have been busting the globe up when it comes to satellites. I don't want you guys to think that they can't have some type of craft in the sky, maybe within a certain medium or uh, using some type of pro propulsion system that may be electrogravitic, right? We don't got to just ignore or dismiss satellites incomplete in, in totality. Like, we don't have to do that anymore, bro. I'm telling you, like, we're falsifying the speed of light in real time with other papers. Like, it gets super crazy, but I don't want to get too much off a of topic. So they sent this satellite up. And I guess it's called uh, Tycho or something like that. And they catalog stars in the sky. Now, according to what this paper says, Tycho main catalog took 1,058,332 observations of stars. Over a million. Okay, so I want to put that number, a million. This is not just, okay, we took 10 pictures or something. No, a million objects that they accounted for. Peep this, y'all. Out of this million, 262,000 records of negative parallax. 262. Now, mind you, this is coming from the European Space Agency, which is strange because you would think that other space agencies would have like some of this data as well. And I couldn't find it. You know, this guy kind of highlights in, in this paper. I think I linked uh, linked the thread here so you could, you know, kind of go through the paper yourself. 
for some reason, the ESA was the only agency to kind of have some of this information. So that was super strange. But out of 1,262,000 records, based off of like a, a, a specific parameter, all had stars moving in the wrong direction. It doesn't end there. This paper then says, next we selected positive parallax objects and they give certain values. With these positive parallax objects, they also recognize 310,000 records of negative parallax. So we have 25% of one type of value of stars and 29% of another value of stars all moving in the wrong direction, bro. That only leaves 46% of stars that aren't doing this. <laughs> you know, I'm like reading this shit. I'm like, bro, like, are they trolling me? Are y'all trolling me? Are you literally telling me 46% of the stars are only doing what we suspect suspected to do? And over 50% of the stars are doing some other shit and y'all didn't tell me about this? Y'all know how many globe earthers came up to me and said, yo, sacred, parallax proves the globe. It proves heliocentrism. I'm like, bro, why didn't you only tell me about negative parallax, though? <laughs> like, what? How y'all just leave this shit out of the whole argument? Yo, I'd be so sick when I find stuff out like this. Because I learned about parallax in Flat Earth, uh, Flat Earth Fridays, by the way. Had no idea before we started the space. It always takes me to do some extra digging to figure out, like, what the hell is actually going on. And I'm, I tell y'all, when y'all when y'all look at the details of some of this stuff, bro, you will find the real truth of what's going on. And the globe earthers will try to gaslight you to make you seem like because you're questioning the actual data, you are denying science. Uh, to me, I'm acknowledging the science. <laughs> like, why are you telling me I'm denying it? Bro, y'all are denying this. 54% of all stars moving in the wrong direction. Are you kidding me, bro? Bro, it doesn't end there. Check this out. It says a further test was conducted to see if the stars moving across the uh, astrometric instrument slit were directionally different in the northern celestial hemisphere to what they were in the southern celestial hemisphere. So they're saying, okay, well, let's see. Maybe this is just some random thing that's happening. Like, let's compare in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, and let's see if we can draw some type of correlation. Let's see if there's some consistency here. Bro, 45% of all the stars in the northern celestial hemisphere were all experiencing negative parallax, and 46% of non-zero objects experience, experience negative parallax in the southern celestial hemisphere. So according to this guy, He's saying because there's such a symmetrical distribution of these stars going in the wrong direction. It's not like, oh, there was only five in the southern and then there was like 200 in the northern. This is just like an outlier because, you know, they like to hit you with outliers, right? Anytime it's an outlier, they want to just dismiss it. You know what I'm saying? Like They don't like to acknowledge that. So this guy said, well, hey, uh, this is kind of symmetrical. It seems like the percentage is pretty even which means this is a naturally occurring phenomenon so you can't gaslight me mr globe earther about this being a one-off event an outlier oh it doesn't fit within the paradigm it's instant no 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 there is a literal symmetrical distribution it gets worse guys it gets worse. It says, in the geocentric model of the universe, the stars occupy a shell. Now, look, this was kind of funny to me. And I don't know if concave cellular earther is in here, but this kind of looked like a concave cellular earther diagram. I ain't going to lie to you. <laughs> but we're going to get into that. This is just this guy's interpretation, right? Um, it's called a stellatum. I, I might not even be pronouncing that right. Hope you guys are keeping up with me. So it says, Walter Van Kemp calculated the distance to the uh, stel stellatum, stellatum, I'm gonna just say stellatum. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But this is like where the stars are, right? It's almost like we're in this celestial sphere, 
And this guy said, hey, I can calculate the distance to where these stars are based off of a geocentric model. Bro, you know what this guy says? He says, if, we, if we're correct about the Earth being in a geocentric or geostationary position, this would cause the whole universe to be, let me just say this real slow. This will cause the entire universe to be 121 billion times smaller than we were taught. Now, y'all know we always talk about localized phenomena. Yo, there's a local sun, a local moon, everything's closer. This guy said, and this is based off a of globe model, right? So this don't even really, this is not even flat earth. This is a globe earther saying, hey, bro, <laughs> just so y'all know over there in the back, if if this is not the earth moving around the sun, like y'all been telling us this whole time, seeing that half of these stars are going in the wrong direction, bro. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell everybody that actually this universe is 121 billion times smaller than what they've been telling us. Bro, what? Was y'all taught about this in school? Was, was y'all given this like option? Like, was, did y'all brain synapse? Like, was y'all opened up to this before or, or, or not? Nah? Is this y'all first time hearing this? Because I'm telling you right now, I couldn't even believe this. Now, I've already kind of known about like negative parallax, but I didn't know it was going to get this bad, bro. Like at all. Now, let me move through this because I got two more screenshots and I'm going to let Alan take over and I'm going to open up the mics and I'm going to see what y'all got to say. And I want refutations from the globe earthers that's in here. Like dead ass, bro. And I don't want to hear about instrument instrumentation error, outliers, because I already acknowledged that. I want y'all to give me the exact reason why this is happening and don't obfuscate away from what we're talking about, bro. <laughs> because, like, this is damning to heliocentrism, bro. Like, you, there's no getting around this unless y'all have a viable excuse. Now, let me get through this real quick. So it says, the important thing to keep in mind with the geocentric universe explanation for negative parallax is that not uh, it is not the so-called background stars of conventional astronomy that are the furthest away from us, but rather those stars that display negative parallax readings. In other words, the background stars, which are in the majority, are actually displaying parallax with respect to the stars that we associate with negative parallax readings. 46% of all stars are located between the limits indicated by the two dotted lines. And there was a figure, you can go click on the link. Uh, the center point of all stellatum thickness, we see that this would imply 27% of stellatum stars would be closer to us and thus display a positive parallax. And 27% would be further away. The 27% are inner stars and 27% are outer stars. By definition, any perceived motion within geostationary universe must be due to the object seen to be moving, just as the sun travels the full extent of the orbit in one tropical year. So to the stars that exhibit parallax would have to be complete their orbits in the same time. The size and cause of this motion is not considered here. Let me repeat that. The size and cause of this motion is not considered. Rather, the emphasis is placed on the capacity of the geocentric model to accommodate negative parallax, whereas negative parallax measurements are totally incompatible with the eccentric universe hypothesis and need to be dismissed in that case as simply statistical errors. My bad, guys. We know we told y'all 54% of the stars is going to move that way, but our stats, we was kind of we kind of made a mistake. Statistical error, instrumentation error. Don't worry about it. Trust me, though. It's really doing what it's supposed to be doing. <laughs> like, wait, what, bro? I'm going to end with this last screenshot. This is the conclusion. 
And this kind of wraps the whole paper like up in one thing. And I'll go ahead and, and let Alan kind of take over to do his thing. Here's the conclusion. It is indisputable fact that the stellar parallax, like the phases of Venus, has been widely cited as proof <laughs> that the world orbits the sun. This is unfortunate since the phenomenon proves no such thing. <laughs> Yo, I was crying reading this. The only thing it does prove is that either the world is moving with respect to the stars or the stars are moving in respect to the world. Like literally, bro, you can't sit there and tell me that the stars are moving and that's proof that we're moving even though all the stars are moving in the wrong direction. Like it's, this is how crazy it has gotten, bro, just to keep the earth in motion. Like I want you to really hone in on this. At this, geocentrists usually rest their case, claiming that the adoption of a heliocentric philosophy is just as much a matter of faith as the adoption of geocentric philosophy. So basically, you know how we'd be saying, like, you know, the heliocentric ideology is nothing but a religion. Like, you got to believe in it in order for it to work. And when it doesn't work, you got to simplify it so that way it keeps working or else it falls apart. So when you start invoking faith in science, that's a religion, guys, in case you didn't know. However, this invocation of faith is unnecessary and unjustified. For if it were such a simple choice between the world going around the sun or some stars moving slightly in order to the conveniently given the appearance of the world going around the sun, then the heliocentrist would have a point of strong probability in their favor and geocentrism would indeed become more faith than science contrary wise it is worthwhile noting that the credibility as regards to the size of the sun and moon this producing the observed solar eclipse effect that we marvel at sits more comfortably with the intelligent design position that geocentrism tends to imply wow that's beautiful rather than with the heliocentrism or heliocentrism excuse me and their claim of coincidence it's just a coincidence that it looks like it's stationary in the stars it's not really like that guys this is it's just an illusion like don't trust your god-given senses matter of fact don't even trust our instruments because more than half of the time our stats are wrong <laughs> but trust me y'all we got this just please don't look into the numbers <laughs> like bro this is crazy. The phenomenon of stellar parallax is not what we have been generally led to believe because in exactly the same way that Eddington, quote unquote, proved Einstein's general theory of relativity in 1919 by rejecting, omitting, or just outright deleting 60% of his measurement data of starlight. Just so modern astrophysics, main, astrophysics maintains the misconception that parallax, quote unquote, proves the Copernican philosophy Man. of the world hurtling around the sun. Just ignoring and dismissing the entire data set of ne negative parallax measurements. Bro, do you know how dishonest? Let me just let me just slow this down real quick. I know I'm taking my time with this, y'all, but just just think about this. Imagine you as a flat earther and you are engaged with somebody on Twitter and your mentions and they call you an idiot. And you say, hey, bro, I got measurements of the flat earth. And they say, show me your measurements. And you say, hey, yo, uh, I, I got about 40 percent of them. The other 60 percent didn't really align with flat earth. So I'm not going <laughs> to show you that. I'm going to just show you the 40 percent that aligns with my belief. What do you think is going to happen to you in that motherfucking uh, thread? Do you think any globe earther is going to let you say that you got 40% only? You think they're going to let that slide? Do you think that you think it's going to ignore that? Okay. Hold on, you breaking up for I'll say it again. Try one more time. 
because I know this is crazy, bro. I know this is crazy. All right, I'm gonna let you get it right. Let me finish this up here, bro. Forty, like deleting, omitting, rejecting sixty percent of your observations just to keep the Earth in motion is fucking crazy, bro. It's literal insanity. Almost finished. To continue, the ESA, European Space Agency, unlike editing before them, have kept and filed data values which do not fit in the ruling model of the universe and should be commended for, for doing so. But nevertheless, they do seem to dismiss a significant proportion of their measurements rather glibly. I kind of like that word, glibly. <laughs> of course, they do say that these may arise due to measurement error, but the number and symmetrical distribution, which we just covered, of these values would tend to deny this as being anything other than an exception to the rules. Always like, yeah, I know we established these parameters, but, you know, we got to make an exception, bro. Like, just trust me, instrumentation error, statistical analysis, uh, misinterpretation, yeah, all that, right. Furthermore, although angular parallax measurements are small, largest positive values given uh, at these angles on the order of uh, these values, the effect is known to be genuine by way of photographic plates taken at various times over a period of 12 months, which clearly show the same slight movement of some stars with respect to the background star field. In other words, stellar parallax is an observable phenomenon that is repeatable rather than being experimental or statistical errors in measurement. So they're saying, hey, bro, uh, I know you told us that it was a measurement error, but why does it keep happening in a cyclical manner? <laughs> is the instruments cyclically making errors is that what's happening is there like a programmable cyclical error mechanism in the instruments or the data set like is that is that what's going on no bro no and this is the same thing that we have with other observations when we talk when we talk about like the consistency of things that like falsify the speed of light or the motion of the earth like we see it all the time and they keep on attributing this to measurement error bro this hand wave dismissing it almost like seeing long distance observations and saying it's just got to be refraction and then they'll gaslight you and say well do you not agree with refraction no bro we said we know refraction exists but every single time that we falsify the radius of the earth or the globe in its entirety in its size with long distance observations, you just dismiss it with refraction. You just dismiss it with measurement or instrumentation error. And I'm so sick of it, bro, because this is the thing that they lean on all the time. Like, why do they gotta be so dishonest? Okay, let me finish this up. Last thing, when the full picture is revealed and considered, right? Therefore, it is clearly geocentrism that has the potential to fully and adequately account for the hundreds of thousands again bro hundreds of thousands of negative parallax observations that have now been recorded although it is acknowledged that a detailed explanation is not currently available finally it may be possible to estimate the thickness of the stellatum from the ESA data set of parallaxes. And it goes ahead and lists some references. Um, like I said, I think I did. Yeah, I included the link here. Um, bro, this is literally crazy. We're talking about something that they put in the sky and they say, yo, you, you, my friend, what we, all of our engineering that we use to develop your mechanisms to keep track of the stars, we want you to take a million observations and we designed you to take a million observations. Oh, wait a minute. 60% of them don't align with our belief. 
our instrument in the sky designed to do this very thing is only 40% accurate. Yeah, that, that's what we'll go with. It's only 40% accurate, guys, which means we could just dismiss 60% of it, and that means it's 100% accurate, okay? I know we see the stars moving in the wrong direction, but that's just because the thing that we designed it to do can't do it 100% of the time. I promise you, that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> Yo, let me tell y'all something, man. I know it takes a lot to go through some of the papers I know some of the scientific jargon might be a little bit intimidating if you're not used to some of the terminology. But, bro, this is not that difficult, bro. And if y'all don't have time to look at some of these things, please continue to show up to Flat Earth Friday because we are putting in that work for the free, by the way, just so we can show y'all what it really is. So the next time somebody tweet a word at you that say parallax, just link them to episode 84. Say, y'all, don't even talk to me until y'all see that thread that's sacred and, and Allen and Proud done put out. Just don't even, I don't even want to hear nothing about Parallax until y'all address that thread. Direct every, just search the word Parallax and Flat Earth on Twitter and just send them to this thread right here. Because, bro, I'm telling you I need answers, bro. I don't want to hear about instrumentation error. I don't want to hear about statistical analysis error. I don't want, like, I don't want to hear about outliers. I don't want to hear about co correct, none of that, bro. Y'all got to tell me why you're saying we are in motion, but the stars are going the wrong way over 60% of the time. That's what I want to know. And y'all should want to know that answer too. Don't you? Like, wouldn't y'all want to know why? Bro, every single time I read this, it just, it's funny as hell, but it pisses me off, bro. Because these glow birds came up in here one day and they gaslit me before I even knew what parallax was. And so I said, y'all don't know what you talking about. Parallax, bro, proves the globe. And I'm like, shit, I never even heard about parallax before. Now I gotta, I gotta put in some work. I gotta look at this. You left out 60% of the reason why this is an invalid argument, bro. Now I'm tight <laughs> because I, I trusted that you weren't lying to me because y'all got science. Y'all tell me all the time that I'm the one denying the science. And then when I ask you about the science, you gaslight me about what the observations are. Why would you have to do that? And then you insult me because I'm questioning the data that you decided to leave out. Bro, that don't piss y'all off. Like, we only sitting up here for, what, 84 weeks trying to figure out where the hell we live at. And then we got to deal with the science community gaslighting us to believe something that isn't true. Banking, about every Glober that's ever brought up Southern Star Trails as a as a refutation to Flat Earth. You Think about all me? the times they try to throw celestial observations at you as if it means something. And trust, we got Shane in this bitch, bro. Shane St. Pierre. And if y'all ain't see his recent uh celestial observation breakdown, bro. <laughs> oh my goodness, we got so much sauce coming for y'all. We just giving you a piece of like what we're talking about, bro. Like there's so much to learn about where we live at. And it will just be nice to not have to like get through the bullshit, like not have to like figure out, okay, is this physicist gaslighting me because he knows about this or is he just ill-informed right nobody in particular right i'm not calling out anybody in particular just saying in general like when i'm talking to somebody on twitter and you say hey you study science and hey sacred have you got your master's degree and da -da -da? no but can you explain negative parallax and why y'all leaving all of this out can you can you tell me why you didn't mention this in the beginning can you tell me why that this completely refutes everything that you have been insulting me about at homonymia? Y'all heard what just happened earlier tonight. This man saw the word parallax. He heard gravity and said, oh, bro, I don't even want to have a conversation. I'm just going to call him an idiot and I'm just going to leave. <laughs> like, that was the best thing that you could do, my guy, just so you know if you're still listening down there. So, look, hopefully that y'all was had a little bit of fun with that. 
to me, I'm infuriated, bro. I'm sorry. Like, it's funny as hell, like I said, but I am tight, bro. There's no reason why I should be finding this stuff out. First of all, there should be no reason why y'all are finding this shit out on Twitter. <laughs> Zero, bro. Like, this is something that we should have all known about. Like, this is something that nobody should have just omitted from the conversation trying to gaslight me on why I'm saying, like, hey, bro, I don't feel the earth moving. The instrumentation doesn't detect the earth moving. And even the effects of the movement aren't even moving in the right direction. Bro. It's like everything is working against your motion of this earth, bro. Listen, do not let these guys gaslight y'all no more, bro. Don't let it happen. Question everything. Question what I'm telling you right now. Do your own research. The link is right there. I'm not hiding shit from y'all. And I'm very open to be corrected. If you're an astronomer down there, I think I seen my man Hap. Uh, I think he was like some type of an astrophysicist. Don't know if he's still here. Probably not. Would left definitely love to talk to him about this. If not, I could definitely see why. <laughs> but if you are anybody with any credential, if you are studying this in real time without a credential, if you have any refutation, please, man, get ready to grab your mic. Grab this mic because I, I want to hear about this. I need to figure this out. And if y'all don't have a valid answer, then we need to go with what we call Occam's razor, the most simplest explanation of these observations. We don't got to overcomplicate it to keep your paradigm intact. I'm not interested in making sure your physics is easy enough to you con continue your work. I don't care about that. I want the truth. And you should too. Prow, you want to add anything before we get to Alan? Yeah, just you know, you know, we we talk about the model and its totality. Uh, you know, we're always forced or required to bring the to the whole model in totality together. So I just want to make sure we all understand, like, don't let none of the global birthers gaslight the conversation to where only one part of it matters. Like. They need the motion, they need the shape, they need the orbit, they need all of it in order to make sense. They can't compartmentalize it into what they want it to be for their specific observation. So we definitely want to make sure when y'all moving forward, like don't let them try to say, well, you know, just, just one motion or it's just the motion of one star is from the earth or from earth spin. Like, nah, it's all of it. Y'all got to remember it's all of it. It's every account that they have to take should be accounted within this quote unquote parallax and it, and it's interesting. Um I, I wanna let them continue. Uh, I see Hap down there. Hap if you Oh if you yeah yeah down, yeah I'm gonna, you, I'm gonna send you back a mic. Yeah yeah send send Hap a mic. Um we're not gonna let them speak just yet. Um I'm gonna make sure Alan you good to go? Yes sir can you hear me testing Alan 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 my man my man my man you there microphone check Microphone. Alan, 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 my man, my man, my man, you there? Hey guys, while Alan gets right, um, Please do me a favor and tweet out the space. I probably should have said that before I went into the breakdown. I wanted as many people to hear this as possible. Um, episode 84, Parallax and a Motionless Earth. It's Flat Earth Fridays, y'all. And the stars are moving in the wrong direction. What's happening? Uh-oh, Alan, are you in the ether? I'll bring uh Shane up, bring Hap up, and then I'll send Alan a mic. I think he dropped down. 
Um, I see you, 40. I see you, KP. Yo, testing one, two. How's that? How's that going? Now, it's not it's not all of the stars, right? Like, I think this one particular instrument only took a million observations for all of the billions of gaseous suns out there <laughs> in the globe model. Yo, right? can you hear me, um, Sacred? Yes, yes. Okay. Hold on, let me send you the codes. Awesome. Sorry about that. My mic just, you know, Twitter just decided that it, it didn't know how my mic worked. Be like that sometimes, man, especially yeah. when we're like destroying the paradigm, like kind of like doesn't yeah. when we do that. Yeah. Coincidence, dude. Second time I go to talk about parallax, mic cuts out. I don't know. All right. We ready to get into it? Yeah, man, let's get it. Hey, Elon, don't crash us this time. Last time we tried to talk about parallax and aberration. You was trying to hate on us. Let Alan do his thing. All right, cool. And, and also, before I continue, that was a great rendition of the whole situation at hand, man. Great recap. If anyone, oh, if if anyone needs a like a refresher on parallax, you want to go back and learn about it. What Sacred just laid out was like pristine, man, one to one. All right, so I'm gonna kind of piggyback off the back of that because you um you already you, you laid it out really well. So I'm gonna kind of breeze through. <clears throat> excuse me, one second. We're going to breeze through parallax and then we're going to get into stellar aberration because after we've because uh, immediately after uh, we show them all this negative parallax, which completely refutes their model because the parallax has to go in the same direction if it's going to be attributed to the motion of Earth. Um, what they'll do is they'll they'll jump to stellar aberration. But don't worry, your boys got you covered. So we'll get into that as well. All right. Get it. And I just went ahead and I shared uh, Alan's live to the top. So whatever he's showing on his screen, you guys can follow along in real time in spaces. You hear to hear first, man. Ain't nobody doing this like us. Go ahead, Alan. Cook them. All right, cool. So just to catch everyone up to speed, these measurements are taken in arc seconds, right? And if you're not familiar with that type of measurement, if you look at a protractor and you look at the distance between one and two degrees, if you break, you can break that up into 60 sections. That'll be 60 arc minutes. And then you could break each minute up into one, uh, you know, 60 seconds. So you can break one, you can break the distance between one and two degrees into one 360th of a degree, right? So you can make really, really fine measurements, or that's what they're saying anyway, right? So to kind of conceptualize that, if you hold your finger out at arm's length into the sky and you, and you just look at your finger, like the distance between your finger, if you imagine that you could divide that into one 300 or one 3,600th of a degree, um, you know, that's basically... Uh, like the little sliver of sky that you would be looking at. That's kind of what they're getting at when they, how they have the sky broken up into little sections for degrees so that they can make their measurements. Now as sacred laid out earlier, um, they show you this diagram here for stellar pair or yeah, for stellar parallax. They, so they'll do a six months observation period. So they'll take an observation here in January and they'll take another one here in July and they'll say, okay, based on the 93 million mile distance relationship to the sun, and the distance that it would take for Earth to travel around uh, the, the sun in six months, that we can take sh pictures of, the, of stars in the sky and reference them six months later and extrapolate a distance uh, relationship the same way you can do uh, making parallel observations on Earth. Now, a couple of things with parallax observations on Earth. Now, it's a real thing. It's a real phenomenon, and it's super useful, actually. You can use it to make really accurate estimations. But here's the thing. There's a relationship with the baseline of your triangle and the distance and the size of the object that you're trying to observe. Actually, I'm not sure about the size, but the distance for sure. So the distance of the triangle, um, the, the baseline, like the angles of it, the accuracy of your estimation is going to be uh, is going to be based off of all those factors. Right. So you have to have like uh, what they call like, I, I don't know the, the threshold off the top of my head, but it's uh, it's not going to be what the what they what they actually show us here. So when you Google stellar parallax, You'll see all these angles here, right? These all look reasonable. It looks like a nice little 45 and a 45. It's definitely meeting up at a point. There's definitely a semblance of a triangle here, right? And that's what they really want to impose with their with the triangularity. But what they don't tell you there is that these angles aren't, they're not triangles, right? The precision of these angles, they're more like 89.9999999999999 degrees um, on both sides of this because the distance is so far, they basically have to meet at infinity. So what they actually, you know, they're showing you this, but the math that they're using to describe everything is essentially two parallel lines that they say convert or converge 
at infinity and to make a point to where they can derive a distance based off based off of that angle so the um these the angles that they're showing you here now these are like what what i um i don't have the video prepared but you can go to um just google or youtube like astronomy parallax tutorial or whatever right and you'll see like the baseline of the triangles that they use they can't they don't do triangles like 89.999999 degrees right that's insane two parallel lines that converge at infinity just trust us right so to kind of move on here um this just this gets into re regards to um how they how they get parallax i'm sorry parsecs and distances out of these so you can there's a distance relationship but we're not really going to get into that um so okay and then like like sacred was saying here so the angles that they show you for geocentric they say that these are exclusive proofs of the of geocentrism and they show this in textbooks right the heliocentric proof they don't show you the geocentric version which is just an inversion of the angles the angle prediction is the same they're they make identical predictions um, so so now we're going to get into stellar aberration now stellar aberration is um, what I in my opinion it would be their best uh, proof of, of motion right because they do get a mathematical relationship which will, which we'll go over here in a second that is interesting but uh we'll touch more on that here in a second so the premise here is that based on earth's orientation and rotation uh and its you know motion around the sun that starlight coming in will be um it'll come in at like an arc relative to your latitude so if you're at the if you're at the north pole and you're looking up you'll see the, uh, over the course of a year if you were to plot the stars out their motion you would see that they process tw 20 arc seconds so like a little tiny arc in a, in a that, uh, that that would complete a circle if you were to plot it out okay and then if you're around the 45th northern northern latitude you'll kind of see it um, make like a, what do you call it like an oval a little bit and then if you get closer to the equator you'll see an ellipse and then on the equator you'll see it just a straight line right that's that that's the that's what they tell us and they say that based off of the angle of that, when you ratio that against the speed of light, you get 30 kilometers a second. So they're like, oh my God, no way. This is proof of, uh, this is proof that the earth is motion is in motion because the angle that they produce is a cosine. So they take that as, as, um, as when they apply the ratio, they take that as being in the direction of motion. So they're like, okay, cool. That's a, that, that's a cool relationship. So to, to point out real quick, this uh this was known in let's see uh 1898 a guy named will wilhelm win post the or post um published a paper titled about the question concerning the translational movement of light atoms and this is in regards so what he goes over is he goes over 10 experiments that were supposed to prove that the earth is in motion and none of them did and but he gives he gives uh a positive proof example though and one of the one of the examples he gives is that's is the uh stellar aberration right with that 30 kilometers a second relationship so this is a translation of his paper because i think it was written in french um so this is this is the translation we're going to read a little bit from it here so it says experimental with positive results so he's talking about um the the list of positive results for earth's motion he's saying and in, in, in his time right so the aberration of light is fixed to the stars. The aberration found by a simple explanation based on the emission hypothesis of light. The difficulties in the undulation theory are only quite recently eliminated by Hendrik Lorentz's uh, by assuming the ether. And then by this is by nature, the general kinematics of, of general kinematic significance, but must nevertheless be taken into account when the question of moving or resting ethers. And then, so what, what he's saying there. Is that um, it's cool that they found a relationship with that 30 kilometers a second, but they need some more substantial proof if they're gonna go on with anything. Because e even back then, like they knew about uh, kinematics and dynamics and that relationship, and they knew that this measurement, right? It's not, it's not a mutually exclusive proof of anything, right? This uh, this ratio that they derived. So, a couple of uh, explanations for stationary flat earth side will be every night the stars rotate so, um, in the sky over the course of a year that's going to produce it that could produce a procession and actually if you're in if you're into the ether model the eth 
with ether drag um there's our model predicts a a uh, a procession of light a dragon light um in that regard over the course of a year so lots of mechanisms for it on our side um you know that they, 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 they just try and say that it's mutually exclusive because of that uh kinematic relationship but again not super substantiatable and then on top of that we got the negative parallax issue that um that sacred already went over so i'm not going to read read too much into this but um I'll just kind of recap here so first uh frank dyson watson steps in to say hey you know statistical error with the with the analysis with the measurements maybe we can uh do some math here and uh and round this down to a positive parallax right and then the second explanation here is they say well maybe there's a binary star system and they're rotating close together and because they have an irregular uh, pericity for their orbit due to the gravitational uh, differences between them you know because they're two giant giant balls coalescing in the sky right so maybe there's a gravitational anomaly and they're just out of position and it just looks like it's uh <clears throat> it just looks like it's a negative parallax go ahead and count it as a posi so when they get into the third explanation there they're like well maybe our distances are off maybe the background stars moved oh wait what are the background stars again oh the ones that they the ones that they say don't move that they use to reference for the ones that they say that do move so maybe the reference point moved you know who knows it's all very confusing in the heliocentric model and i added this uh to my presentation from what sacred found earlier this is excellent so this is a huge data set and collection of what they call uh or you know from satellites in space right so they say because there's no at atmosphere in space that they can get these really really fine measurements so earlier we were talking about arc seconds right now when you're looking at the from a telescope on earth into the sky quoted the best measurements that you can get are two to three arc seconds right you very rarely are going to see one arc second this is a ledge i've never looked through a telescope this is just things i've read from telescope lads so they say that looking through the looking up at the sky is like looking up through an ocean you know things are waving around undulating uh, dancing around through the through the through the ocean that is our atmosphere right so when you're in quote unquote space you know there's no atmosphere so they say that they can get even more precise measurements even more accurate right so maybe maybe these were just atmospheric anomalies maybe our optics aren't good maybe there's something going on here well how about your boy space satellite you know looking looking back in into infinity essentially right maybe he can get some good accurate measurements so he's measuring down into the micro arcs. So if we recall back to the first slide here, we have our pyramid of uh, or our tier of measurements here. So arc seconds, uh, sorry, arc minutes, arc seconds, and milli arcs. So they say that. So remember how we could break a degree down to one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. They're saying they have a measurement of one three million six hundred thousandth of a degree. So they've broken it down this far, and they're still getting symmetrical negative parallax very interesting stuff that we're going to be diving into in the future here so these are massive data sets so this one the the tycho catalog and then there was another reference to to the gaia data set so that's cool so real quick to touch on uh, before we cap out here so one more thing with the stellar aberration another thing to explain is alan we live on a flat earth though how are we going to get these different processions relative to the latitude well, if we live in a toroid and we see in toroidal geometry, which it turns out it's a it's more than equivalent to Euclidean geometry and actually outperforms it with predict with depth perception predictions at the horizon. So more ac so curved visual space more accurately represents um, where we live. But anyway, so we see in toroids, we live in a toroid. The sky is the sky is a projection inside of a toroidal field. So you're going to get something that looks like this when you add atmospheric conditions. I'll let this play out. Sorry for the small video. You can get the full link here. This is from Witsit's episode, uh, Schooling the Globers, Episode 7, the Azimuthal Grid. So when he, when when uh, atmospheric conditions are applied to these, or to the, um, to the optics in the sky, you're going to see exactly what you would see on a quote-unquote globe. So one second here, we'll let this fully play out before I reset it again midway. All right. So this is no refraction, and then this is adding the refraction. Oh, look. It looks like what we see on the globe. All right. Cool. So I think that's I think that's everything, man. I think that's everything for parallax and stellar aberration. So 
They've uh, they've been trying to draw a relationship with, with the motion of the Earth and things in the sky for a long time. But as as even noted by the the boys back in the 1800s, it's a cool kinematic relationship. But we're gonna need some some more to to substantiate it. And then to follow up on that paper, by the way. So that was the one proof that he listed that kinematic measurement. And then he goes through experiment. What's this? Experiments with a negative result. Oh no. Mickelson Morley, Aries failure, a bunch of other ones, Arago, you know. So if you, if you want to learn more about those guys, we'll be doing presentations on them on Ether Cosmology, 7 p.m. Eastern at two, on Tuesday. All right, that's all I got to say on Parallax. I think I'm going to turn it back over to Sacred Man. <laughs>